Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here this evening and thank you so much to photo.no for having me. Um, little bit about me to start. So I'm Charlene Winfred um, and I was born and raised in Singapore. In 1999, I moved to Australia to go to university and ended up staying for the next 14 years. Um, I had always been interested in cameras because I'm kind of nerdy, but Australia was where I actually got to do something about it. Um, because once I started working, I could actually afford to buy one, a camera that is. So I started photography in the late 2000s and went straight into digital. Um, for me, there was an instant connection to photography, to digital, just doing everything on the computer. And some years later, I actually started a wedding photography business with a friend. So we had this business for a good five years while still working at our day jobs. And it taught us a lot about the business of photography, lessons which I'm grateful for to this day. But then it all changed. So in 2013, I was fed up of the nine to five life. I was convinced that there was something more to living than that routine. Um, so I decided to see for myself. I left my job. I sold my house and car and either sold, gave away or discarded everything that I couldn't carry with me. In January of 2013, I found myself on a plane to North America with everything I owned in two bags. And that was the start of my nomad life, which I might add is on hold right now because of COVID. But today I'm sharing the story of that journey and that is also a journey that I've always had a, a Fuji X-Series camera with me on. So I thought I would give you, actually, before I go on, I just wanted to say that um, I know uh, a lot of you are watch probably watching this on YouTube. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, Thomas, who's moderating, will collect those questions and we can have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. Okay, back to the camera. I thought I would give you some background on my history with Fujifilm before we go on. So I sustained a back injury in 2011 and my physiotherapist told me I had to stop carrying my 20 kilos of DSLR gear uh, on to wedding shoots every weekend. So I stopped shooting weddings at that point, but I had always wanted a smaller and lighter camera for my personal work. Um, so enter the X-Pro1, which is the, uh, camera in the picture, which you, you can see too, it's been through a certain kind of hell and back. Um, I took these pictures in 2015 after three years of traveling and daily heavy use in that time. Um, so it wasn't a honeymoon at the start. I found the Pro One surprisingly difficult to adjust to, largely because it was so slow after my machine gun DSLR. Um, but there was always something about about it, like the working so hard for one shot, you know, the, the funny way in which I had to operate it, that what I was so unfamiliar with, I just, I just fell in love. And um, in 2014, I was appointed an ex-photographer, which is what Fujifilm calls their ambassadors, on the strength of my work with the X-Pro1 and um, the XF35 F14 lens that you see in the picture there. This kit was the only camera gear I had for several years, and I got to know it really, really well. Then enter the X-Pro2. So in 2015, I was part of the X-Pro2 promotional project. And so, of course, once it was out, I got a production body almost immediately. This, this beautiful graphite baby that you see in the photo is almost five years old, five years old at this point and it's still my primary camera. I was part of the X-Pro3 launch project in 2019, and I loved the new X-Pro3. I'd always told Fuji that, you know, when they made all of these new incarnations of X-Pro, they must have had somebody like me in mind, because for me, 
after the initial learning curve of the X Pro One, everything fell into place and I found it really, really, really uh, intuitive. And I've enjoyed using um, later models of X Pro. But in, tw in 2020, I really resisted getting myself an X Pro 3. I mean, largely because I don't need it. There's, there's nothing that my X Pro 2 can't do that I need it to do. Um, and so, so five years, X Pro 2. This was going to be the end of my camera show and tell, except guess what arrived in the mail just this afternoon? And I'm not, I'm not kidding about this afternoon either. Just a few hours ago, um, it's 11 p.m. now in Singapore. Um, just this afternoon, a few hours ago, courier came, dropped a box off, and this was in it. So why did I get the Pro 3? So I realized at some point that this year is my 10th year using the Fujifilm system. And I thought I would celebrate by getting the one Fuji camera that I really, 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 really wanted for the last couple of years. So <laughs> big up to Karl Lueberg of Fujifilm Nordic for hooking me up. I'm over the freaking moon. I, I love the X Pro 3 and I just, I cannot wait to get to work with it. Um, so I've used a different, but I've used a, a bunch of different X-series cameras at this point. Um, I use the X-T3 for video. I've variously also used the various X-E models. This is this, like the smaller brother of the X-Pro series. So you'll get to see photos going forward with taken with all of these cameras, but the X-Pro is still my favorite. So, but you might ask, given I used to be a DSLR shooter, how did I know I was gonna be able to work with the X series? It all started in New Mexico. So let's backtrack to 2012 when I still had a DSLR system and the X Pro One was really new in my life. I took a month long trip to the USA to visit friends, friends and family. And I brought nothing but the X Pro One, that 35 millimeter lens and two batteries. I was packing really, really light and I didn't have room for the, for the big DSLR gear. Well, so I went to this rodeo with some friends in New Mexico and proceeded to give myself a real workout trying to shoot the rodeo in full manual mode. The X-Pro One and that version one firmware was so slow that it couldn't keep up with the action. So I just had to do it myself. So at that point, I'll admit I had my doubts like, oh, can I actually go forward with this system? But again, I also kept in mind that I'd never shot with a rangefinder before. And I just, I loved how unobtrusive it was. I was walking around talking to all these rodeo stars at the in in International Indian Finals Rodeo in Albuquerque. And they all thought correctly that I was nothing but a tourist. I really had a good time at that rodeo and I got some shots from that day that I don't hate today. I've done some of my best work with the X-Pro1 all those years ago. And since then I've used all of my X-Series cameras for work. I was freelancing uh, between 2013 and 2019. Aside from, in that time, aside from the odd wedding and portraiture commission, um, most of what I shot were events and specifically music events. So Trailer Park Festival was the first of the music events that I ever photographed in Denmark. Um, I'd never been to a music festival in my life. So my eyes were completely open to the vibe and the energy and the raw creativity of an event like this. And I continued shooting summer festivals in and around Denmark and more, more than just pictures, I also made some really great connections with some really incredible people. Um, the guy in this photo is Omar Fendom. He's a Syrian American hip hop artist. He had been, the, the day that I shot this, he had been speaking about the Syrian civil war that afternoon as part of his artist talk for the festival. In 2013, the war had been going on for two years. And it's heartbreaking to think now ten, that you know, um, that the Syrian people have been suffering from war for 10 years today, or this month, including many of Omar's own family who are, who are still in Syria. Through all of the festivals that I've 
that I've shot, um, the one I most enjoyed photographing was Swamp Festival in Copenhagen. Please excuse how I'm inevitably going to get pronunciation wrong here. I tried very, very hard, but I'm not Scandinavian. So some of these words are hard, are hard for me to pronounce. Um, so Strand Festival, Strand Festival in Copenhagen. Um, it base is a festival where unlikely music meets unlikely venues. Like this shot of theremin musician Dorit Chrysler was in a small, cozy cafe in Frederiksberg. And of course, there were the big festivals too. So this is Medina, who's a massive pop star, performing at Distortion Festival in Copenhagen in 2015. She is adored by her fans. And through her entire set, all the girls in the front row were basically wrapped like this. This photo was taken maybe a half minute after the previous one. I was in the photo pit at the Red Bull stage that day, so I was very, very close to all the action. Um, this is Danish artist Zach Christ at Bess Anabun Festival in Aarhus in 2014. So this is one of my favorite portraits that I've done to date. Zach Christ, as I remember him that day, is the embodiment of courage and the fire. So he's an electronic musician who composes live on stage. In this show, he'd come up to the stage and plugged his laptop in for the hour long set. So, or maybe it was 45 minutes, actually, I think it was a 45 minute set. Uh, but from there, everything that could go wrong went wrong. His laptop malfunctioned. It was impossible to calibrate the festival's huge sound system to his music. Um, all kinds of other things happened and his laptop eventually died too. But I gotta give it to Zach. He tried and tried and he just kept trying through that whole 45 minutes. He would try something, something would fail. He'd run around, apologize to the audience and try again. But at the end, when his laptop gave up its ghost and called it a day and went, nope, no more, died. He went up to the stage for the last time, incredibly frustrated, apologized for the last time, bowed and left. And the audience gave him a round of huge applause, which he absolutely deserved. Oh, sorry, where was I? There we go. Sorry about that, <clears throat> hit the wrong key there. Okay, so I have made this portrait of Zach Christ sometime before he went on and it's still one of my favorites. Now we can move. So in all of the music work I've done, I particularly enjoy photographing artists at work. So this is Danish artist, Jessica Simone, recording a new album at Red Bull Studios in Copenhagen. Uh, Jessica and I worked that day to create many, many portraits for her new album. It was a it was a privilege for me to speak to her and hear her story and document that part of her life's journey. I think this is one of the one of the great things about photography that it gives you an in into someone else's life, someone else's work, and really helps you to understand what meaning is to different people. Okay, but I did promise you travel stories with a camera. So let's go back to 2013. Twenty thirteen was when I left Australia for a nomad life. And my first destination was the capital of Mexico, Mexico City. Because I always wanted to go there for some reason. So Mexico City is everything you'd expect, a sprawling city of 20 something million people to be. It was mad in all the best ways. It had all kinds of strange sights too, especially to someone who's used to the quietness of Australian cities or the order of Singapore. It's quite easy to say that there's something in Mexico City for everyone. So I should add at this point that prior to going nomad, I had never traveled before. So I migrated from Singapore to Australia, but migration, which is moving from one place to the other with the intention of sinking roots, 
is quite different to traveling where you're sort of in it for the new and the unfamiliar and you don't need to undertake the massive work of building a life in your new place. So in Mexico, I was there for three months and I got to spend the time to experience all these new things, figure out who I was and figure out, you know, what, what other people are like too. Um, this, is, this is Carlos, a friend of mine. I jokingly called him after a while, my hermano de otra madre, which is brother from another mother in, in Spanish as we would jokingly translated it um, because we were so alike down to our names that we might as well have been siblings. Carlos is Charles in Spanish and Charlene is the feminine version of Charles in Spanish. Um, the light was super good at this corner um, that Carlos is sitting in here. And in the three months I was in Mexico City, he and I and, and some of his friends would hang out here quite a lot, just to people watch. Because this was in the, the center, center of the city. So there's tons of people walking by. He would sketch and I would take pictures like this one, which was taken from the exact same place he was sitting in, in the shot before. But Mexico City was also the place I stepped into a dark room for the first time. I'd mentioned earlier that I started photography with digital. So never, I've never had anything to do with film. This lab belongs to a photographer called Pablo Aguinaco, who taught me how to develop and print photos. Um, that's Pablo in the picture. Um, photo was taken with my X Pro one at ISO 6400, and that was really pushing it at the time. The original raw file is ridiculously noisy. So thank goodness for excellent noise reduction in Lightroom. I met a whole bunch of other creative types too. This is Maurizio La Vista, who is a friend of Pablo's. Maurizio is a writer and he taught me a lot about Mexican history. He is also the only person I've ever met who's been on the entire Silk Road from China to the Mediterranean way back in the, I don't know, 60s or something like that. Tragically, we lost Maurizio to a heart attack last year. Um, but I'm always going to remember everything that he shared with me. It was a gift to spend all of those weeks in his presence with all of his friends, discovering all of the, all of the arts that he loved and he will be fondly remembered. The 2013 was a special year for me. Mexico City might just be the crowning jewel of all of those highlights. And I still, to this day, hope to return again for a very long time someday. Okay, 2014. So 2014 was a wild year. I lost my father to cancer at the end of 2013. And so in 2014, after a year of much grief and tumult in the family, I was lucky enough to work the grief out, to process the grief with a lot of travel. My boyfriend Fleming and I took an epic three month 16,000 kilometer road trip through the western half of, of USA. We saw many awe-inspiring scenes like this, Grand Canyon, which, which, never, which never fails to impress, no matter how many times you've been there. And other scenes in small towns that I would have thought only existed on TV. Clearly they actually exist in real life too. Um, but we also got to visit a lot of national parks that year. The highlight of all of these national parks was Yellowstone National Park up in Wyoming. It was late spring when we got there and we just dr driven past the park entry when we saw this. The bison looked pretty small ambling up the road towards our car. Um, I mean, we were still somewhat alarmed having never encountered one before. Luckily, it adjusted course and walked by the car when it got to us. Um, 
But that was also when we realized that it was the size of the Ford Focus we were in and probably weighed the same too. Yellowstone is gorgeous. We saw wolves at twilight, waited for Old Faithful with all of the other tourists, um, got a glimpse of the apocalypse at Grand Prismatic Springs, and then headed up to Grand Teton National Park, where we got to stand at the spot where Ansel Adams made his famous photograph of Snake River against the mountains. This, this was photographic nirvana. There are so many other stories I could tell, but they all underline the same thing. That for me, there's really nothing, nothing at all like being on the road. All right, 2015. 2015, I was part of the Expo 2 project. So Fleming and I decided to head to Sri Lanka to see what we would find, since neither of us had been there before. So except for this photo, I made the entire project about the railway. And the people who took the train into Colombo Central Station the train, I might add, that ran by the, right by the sea. For that project, um, we really wanted to test the high ISO capability in the Pro 2. And Colombo Central Station at night really tested the Expo 2's low light capability. This is a JPEG straight from the camera, I believe, and shot at ISO 10,000. I'm gonna end my Sri Lanka stories with this particular one. This photo always makes me laugh. So the old man on the right has the exact look on his face that my father used to have whenever I pointed a camera at him. You know, the whole, oh, are you still taking photos of me sort of look. I don't know how many of you have parents that do that, but um, mine certainly did. So he was quite amused though, the, the old man in the, in the shot. Um, after, after I took the photo and then I just kind of smiled at him and waved a little bit across the aisle. I guess he's quite used to tourists. Okay, 2016. So Fleming and I spent many, many weeks in Belgrade, the capital of Serbia this year. Not this year, but 2016. One of the highlights of the time was actually getting to do some wet collodion or wet plate photography with a local instructor called Darko Illich. So I mentioned, I mentioned before that I've never shot film. So wet collodion photography was definitely one of the things that I never thought I'd experience in photography ever, ever. And you know what, it was wonderful. So the process of taking an hour to finish one image on a glass plate is that you just is a process that you can't rush. And it's something that I keep thinking I want to do so much more of over the years, but where I live right now, it feels impossible. So I just have to keep dreaming and keep looking at my plates to remind myself not to keep not to give up dreaming. New Zealand, 2017. Um, got to visit the land of the long white cloud. New Zealand was gorgeous in early spring. And the light, whether stormy, sunny, cloudy, or clear, was absolutely incredible. Everything I pointed my camera at was tinged with a kind of magic. And I'm going to say here that 
I've always thought my, of myself as a street photographer because it's how I operate and I just, I, I love the streets. It's my first, it's my first love and it's what drew me to street, uh, to drew me to photography in the first place. I mean, but, but when, when I was in New Zealand, I was faced with these like incredible, just jaw dropping scenes. It was really, it was impossible really not to turn into some kind of crazed landscape shooters. So I spent about six weeks shooting nothing but landscapes. Very often at f1.2 on the 56, because it was all, all these scenes were just so still and so dreamy and so magical and that shallow depth of field just, just added a little bit to the surrealness of the scene. So Fleming and I had planned to drive from Auckland in North Island and make our way down to South Island. But a couple of weeks actually into this trip, um, we got into a car accident. Um, nothing bad happened, thankfully, but we did also decide in the end that we were too sore for anything more adventurous than meandering very, very slowly and very, very carefully to various forests, beaches and parks. I mean, we didn't break anything, although the, the, car, the car we were driving at the time was total, but we were very extremely bruised from, from the accident. So, um, so it was just slow going from there. In any other place, that would have been a real shame. I think I would have been annoyed and just disappointed. But seriously, everywhere you turn in New Zealand, you just get gifted with this incredible light. So it wasn't such a bad thing after all. Okay. So I'm, I'm guessing that most of you in the audience here are Scandinavian. So you're gonna think I'm crazy, especially now when I understand that you've all been through a very long lockdown. Um, when I say that I really love your shitty gray winter weather. Um, when you pair that with castles, which y'all have a lot of, and fog, which y'all also have a lot of too in the cold season. For me, that's just a recipe for magic. I've made like so much work in the gray moodiness of late autumn and winter in Denmark and in, and in Sweden. Um, like this photo. This is one of the favorite, my favorite photos ever that I've, that I've taken. It, it was on a freezing sub-zero day in Hilo. I'd gone walking around Fredericksburg Castle Lake, um, which was mostly frozen. And I saw this old man feeding all of those birds. And it was just, it was just one of those moments that I was arrested by. Um, when, when I just met the scene. I watched him for a little while and took a couple more frames, but this one ended up being the one that spoke to me the most. Um, at this point, I'd been out for an hour and I could no longer feel my feet, my fingers, my toes, my legs. Really, I couldn't feel much at all. Um, but the photo made all of that totally worth it. That also happened to be the same year I headed up to Stockholm where Fujifilm Nordic is headquartered. Um, there was an exhibition at the time called Stockholm Forever in Fotografiska, the Swedish Museum of Photography. Um, it was, for Stockholm Forever was really an exhibition that was an ode to Stockholm and all of the photographers that have loved it over the years. I was, I was really moved by all of the, just the, the pure feeling in all of those photos. And I came away from it, seeing Stockholm through the lens of classic black and white documentary. And so that was all of the, all of the photos that I made in, in Stockholm at that time, more or less looked like this. I can't, I can't process, I, sh I shoot raw, so I could process them in color, but they're not right in color. They were meant to be like this black and white. And Stockholm, Stockholm might be the most beautiful city I've ever had the pleasure of visiting. I love it. Um, even through the mess that is the redevelopment of the Slussen district um, in the photo here, it still retains, for me, I just, I see all these graceful lines and graceful forms and just, you can't run from. I haven't been to Stockholm since then. Um, and I can't wait for the pandemic to be over so I can go visit my Fujifilm family again. OK, 
Okay, now we're up to 2019. So in 2019, I moved to Iraq for a year, the Kurdish, Kurdistan or the Kurdish region, autonomous Kurdish region in Iraq. So most people outside the region think of Iraq as a place that is riddled by war and destruction and bombs and ISIS and whatnot. Um, that's not wrong, but also ordinary life happens too in Iraq. People go paragliding and they have picnics on the mountain to catch a sunset amidst all of the war and destruction and just all of the strife that Iraq has gone through in the last 30, 40 years, there's still moments of just incredible beauty and, and profundity all over Iraq. Like for instance, here's a photo you, you rarely see of Iraq, the fact that it's green in spring. And the mountains are snow-capped in the cold. Um, the, this is the, this is Permagrun Mountain, um, up by the city of Sulaymaniyah. It's a it's an it's a great sentinel in the springtime to a 70s Russian military facility, which is now converted into a maximum security prison for, among other things, convicted ISIS members. Like so much contrast exists in Iraq. Like this old Kurdish lady who's as fierce as Kurdish women are, attending a protest against the Turkish incursion into Syria uh, in October, I think, 2019. Of course, there she is in traditional gear, you know, the party flag on her shoulder, and she's streaming it all on her smartphone. There were raves too in Iraq. I wasn't expecting to attend a music festival or rave in Iraq. So for one reason or the other, I was pleasantly surprised to have attended this one. This, this is the first um, that was organized in Sulaymaniyah, which is the city where I was based. Um, and this particular shot I took at the ending of, a, of, of what was an electronic music concert that lasted four hours. It was organized by a local culture group called X-Line Project. Where artists from where they invited artists from the region uh, to come and play and you know help people dance the night away. But what I went to Iraq for was work. So I worked for a small humanitarian organization called Preemptive Love Coalition. Um, in and in 2019, I was in the field on staff as a photographer and writer. So Preemptive Love has been in Iraq for 12 years, and we do relief and community development with refugees and internally displaced people. So a big part of our work is empowering women to help them to work, to make an income so that they can help themselves and their families to, to build a brighter future, you know, in the shadow of war. So this, this is an example of, of empowering women. So Buthina, who is the woman in the middle in the white polo tee, she and her family had to flee their hometown when ISIS came and destroyed their home. So she fled and then eventually made her way to this camp, uh, which is in Kurdistan, which is in the north of Iraq. And now she operates the only beauty salon in this camp of 10,000 people. And you think, yeah, beauty salon, you know, what's, what's that? What, what difference does that make? Well, a beauty salon, when you don't have much, is more than a place for women to care for themselves. It's also a safe space for women to gather, to chat, to build relationships, and to help each other. This is Kolo. He's a Yazidi and he runs a big farm with his brothers in Sinja, um, which is the town where ISIS came to wage genocide on his people in 2014. Their family was really lucky to escape with their lives. Today, Golo and his brothers have better lives because of the help that preemptive love donors give them. Um, to help their farm and their families and communities rise from that insane 
devastation and trauma. So I, I visited um, Kolo as a field assignment for work in 2019. And so he and I don't share a common language. I don't speak Kurdish or Arabic. He doesn't speak any English. So we communicated through mostly uh, sign language when there wasn't one of my local colleagues around to translate. But, you know, language is so much more than just words. After a while, I would discover that Golo quite enjoyed being photographed. He was having, he was having a field day. Um, so I got a lot of good shots for him because he was extremely obliging and would pose in, in, you know, in all sorts of very fun ways. And my crowning jewel that particular day for portraits was this shot where I somehow managed to convince him that he needed to do a Marlboro Man pose for me. And so here he is standing against the sun with, I don't know what that is. I think it's a, it's a blade of grass in his hand. And he was just, he was extremely happy with the way this, this picture turned out. So that made both of our days. This is Dr. Abdul Qadir. He operates a clinic in one of the last towns to be liberated from ISIS in Iraq. So in Iraq, electricity is not something you can take for granted. Blackouts are frequent and frequently last for a very long time. So it, this clinic in, in May was about 35 degrees Celsius or hotter when the power went out. But you know, so the lights go out, the air conditioning stops working, but not a problem. Dr. Abdul Qadir just grabbed his phone from his pocket, turned the flash on, and continued his examination. Towns like this were devastated during the years that ISIS occupied them. Those who could leave did. Those who couldn't had to stay and live in terror. Doctors like Abdul Qadir didn't have to stay. And they don't honestly have to work here now for little pay and under extremely challenging conditions. But they do because it's their community too. And these are their people. And it's, it's that conviction, like with a hefty, hefty dose of grit and courage that their communities are going to rebuild again because there are an amazing number of people in all of these communities that just teach us how to fight better for another day. So most of the stories that I've heard from refugees and internally displaced people are really hard stories. Um, you'll notice I say refugee and internally displaced. I'll give you a really quick summation, uh, definition of what the difference is. An internally displaced person is someone who is, has been displaced, whether by, by war or something, inside their own country. So they're still in their own country. And a refugee is someone from across an international border. Um, so, so yeah, so this Kaokep is an internally displaced Iraqi. Now, when everything in your life is taken away from you and destroyed, it just, it does terrible things to your spirit. I mean, living in a tent in a displacement camp, often at the mercy of the seasons, with questionable uh, supply of electricity, water, food, it's no walk in the park, to say the least. But there are wins, you know? like helping women to start a business they've always wanted and watching them flourish. So Kawakep is the, is the lady in the middle of the frame and my colleagues Inas on the left and Ashley on the right. So our organization started a business for Kawakep selling clothing because she'd always wanted um, a clothing store. She had done so well that when she went, that she went from being a super quiet, super reserved person when we first met her to 
to quite quite a star. Like she she would she just every time we visit her, she'd make all these endless jokes with this twinkle in her eye, and some of them were quite naughty. And you'll notice in the photo that both my colleagues on the side of the frame are laughing. I was laughing too when I took this this photo because Kawakat was telling a mother-in-law joke. Um, it's so it's just really great to see. There's a lot of hardship in displacement camps. There's a lot of hardship in Iraq, as there are in any place that's been devastated by war. But it's just the, the really small human things like that, that give you hope, you know, and give everyone hope and, and gives, gives them a reason to continue, to continue working towards something better. Kawakep loves her store. So for her, Mondays are good days, Tuesdays are good days, Every day is a good day, just like Fridays or Saturdays. And I could keep going on. I have so many stories to tell from Iraq, but I don't, we don't have time to tell all of them, sadly. Um, so in 2020, actually a year and three days from today, I came back to Singapore to be with my mum because of COVID, because my mom lives here alone. Um, it's been, when I came back last March, I'd been away, that was, I'd been away for 21 years. And after 21 years away, I didn't have the foundations of a life here. My life had not been here for a very long time. Most of my friends and family had also moved away um, and so I was, I, have to, I, had to, I had to start again myself. Um, and so I did what I've learned to do over the last eight years of being a nomad, which basically meant that I looked for other photographers. So Marie Daly and I had connected years before because of a global collective called Women in Street, um, with the street being street photography. So in the, in the photo, Marie's the one with the black shirt, short hair and glasses, who's looking at her phone. So Marie and I, Marie and I agreed to meet and one day we were talking and we, and we said, wouldn't it be nice to have a community of women street photographers here to shoot with? And so in October last year, Women in Street Singapore was born. Today, six months later, we're a thriving community of more than 50 dead keen street photographers and a, and a larger and a larger global community of, I don't know, hundreds. Um, in Singapore, we go for photo walks um, within COVID social distancing guidelines, of course. We have various online spaces to chat about all things photography, run competitions, and are planning our first exhibition or book um, later this year. I mentioned before that I've always thought of myself as a street photographer because that's what I like to do the most. And street photographers come from all walks of life. And we all, and, but all have one thing in common. We're crazy about the theater of public spaces and we ache to capture it. Not all photographers do this, practice this or enjoy this. So there is, for me, there is just nothing like hanging out with fellow street photographers, even in a pandemic, and maybe especially in a pandemic. Around the same time in October, September, October, I met a group of guys called SGSBC, which stands for Singapore Street Photography Collective. I'm a member of this collective now, and I know um, that a few of my crew and um, others from the community are here in the audience tonight. So big up guys for spending your Friday night with me. And the guys at SGSBC introduced me to shooting street with flash. It was a revelation. Oops. My slide didn't load. Okay, I'm gonna go back here and say, I've never seen my country in such interesting light. 
and in such interesting ways. And it's been, I've never used Flash much at all in my entire time with a camera, which has been just over 10 years. It's been a real journey to use the Flash in public because you need to get into people's faces and I am still not sure if I enjoy it, how to do it, how I feel about it. Um, it's I've been doing this flash thing for, I don't know, maybe not quite six months. So this is something I'm definitely going to keep exploring as time goes on and experimenting with as well. Um, I have SGSBC to thank for this though. It's it's really been a revelation and special shout out to Aoi and Den who taught me how to use my little Fuji EFX8 hot shoe flash as well to make all these pictures. I will say having coming home after 21 years, the last time I felt at home in Singapore was when I was in secondary school, like in the 1990s. Singapore feels like home now in no small part because of all of these photographers because it's just there's nothing like having your community at home and while i'm talking about photographic community as well here's my buddy Hassan ibrahim who he filmed my X Pro 3 promotional video in 2019 which you can find on um, fujifilm Global's YouTube channel, I think. Yes, Fujifilm Global's YouTube channel, my bad. So I've been, I've been really lucky to call so many different and beautiful places home over the course of my life. And almost always, it's because there was either just a group or a community of photographers who adopted me, who showed me how to work with the light in their home, how, you know, just, just the gift of, of perspective that only another photographer can give to you because they feel it's important to pass that on. That, that's really special. And I mean, photography is so much more than cameras and lenses and pixels. It would be nothing without all of the people in and around it. So it being the month where we celebrate women, I thought I would leave you with Silva and her daughter. So this is Silva, she's a Syrian refugee and she makes candles for my organization's shop. Um, the very first time I entered her home in camp, I met her daughter, Elaine and Eileen met my cameras. Eileen really, really liked my cameras. She took a shine to the X-Pro, but then one day I walked in with my X-T3 as well. And then when she saw it, she fell in love. Um, I look at this, so Eileen is six actually, I, I will say before I go on, she's tiny. She's probably the size of a three or four year old um, in any of our countries because all she's known in her six years of life is war. Um, I, look, I look at this photo so often. I took it when I, pretty much when I first got to Iraq in March, 2019. Um, I think about where Eileen might be if she were afforded the same opportunities that I or my friends have been. And so I'm going to leave you with this thought for your daughters, your nieces, your friends, your sisters, and your mothers. I hope together we'll make a better world for all girls and women across the spectrums of gender and sexuality and nationality and culture language, religion, politics, etc. A world that's safe for women, that where women and girls get the help that they need. 
to, to, to get out of life what they want to. Because, you know, we're half, the, we're half the population of the world. So imagine how much better of a world it'll be if we were all happy in it. And that ends my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have a couple of questions. Cool. Should um, I, Th Thomas, should I stop sharing my screen? Yeah, you can. Okay. I'll put you on. There we go. A um, couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. As Dean writes, hi, Charlene, I love your photos. They look amazing. And I have a question for you. What's it like shooting streets in Singapore compared to shooting overseas? I will say that Singapore is a really easy place to shoot street. People here are used to cameras for the most part, although, you know, you get scolded every once in a while, but people are used to cameras and they're not very confrontational. And so there's lots of opportunity to really explore street, the, the sort of street you want to shoot here. Great, thank you. Uh, and also, uh, Pierre asks, hi, I love your photos. Do you ask for permission to take portraits on the streets? Oh, that's a good question. When I started shooting with Flash, I didn't because it's just, I, I think I, I take the approach of you keep walking and you shoot. But I think over time, as I've gotten more comfortable with flash and I also have gotten more comfortable with how to, how to use the flash, which I might add, I had no idea about in the beginning. I try and get uh, implied consent. I try in general to make sure that people see me coming, that they see what I'm doing and that they also have the opportunity to, you know, take me up on it. If they should, you know, like have, I, I, I make, I make it a point to have the conversation with people who are unhappy about what I'm doing. I delete pictures when I'm asked to, um, not, not all the time, depending on how fast I'm walking, but, um, in general, I try to be good about it and to be, and to have the conversation with people because I think a lot of people don't understand why people shoot street, what street shooting is about. And often when you stop to show someone what it is, you know, the photo you've taken of them or with them in it, they start, they stop and they, and they stop and they have the conversation. And then suddenly they're like, Oh, wow, that's, 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 in, that's interesting. I've, I've never, I've never thought about it that way before. So yeah. So I, I do try, I do try my best to make sure that people know that I'm that I'm shooting them. Photographing them, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say shooting, but photographing them. Yeah. Uh, Sandra or Bari writes, just awesome talk. Uh, Tuma writes, thank you for taking us on such a vivid journey. And uh, Tony asks, I guess uh, when things are back to normal, where is the first place you plan to go revisit and shoot? The very first place is Malaysia. So I have family all over the world and right next door to Singapore is Malaysia. We all used to be part of the same country. Um, I have a, one of my sisters actually lives there and I'm really close to her and I, I miss her terribly and my niece and my nephew as well. When I'm back in Singapore, I take travel to Malaysia for granted. Many Singaporeans came from Malaysia and have family in Malaysia. So traveling back and forth is just something I think a lot of us are quite used to. Um, coming back during the pandemic to shut borders has been absolutely terrible. I miss my family terribly. And I miss all of my friends and all of the people that I that have come to think of as family. So yeah, it's going to be doing the rounds. It's going to be, it's going to be Malaysia first, then Denmark, then Sweden, then the USA, where I have another sister as well. Awesome. And the last one is a comment that says, uh, Adriana writes, amazing stories and stunning photos. Thank you so much for a re very interesting hour and you are very inspiring. And we thank you as well for uh, the amazing talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And I, I have to say before we go that um, big, big shout out to Fujifilm Nordic who have been my, who have been just giving me this amazing support over all of the years that I've been an ex-photographer, uh, particularly to Karl Lohberg in Sweden and Ip Tordell in Denmark. 
um, these, I would not be doing what I'm doing today, if not for the two of them. So big, big, big shout out to two of them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Yes. Bye bye.